Yeah, so this whole question and answer session, really, for us at IC Steps, we wanted to be able to share our knowledge um, that we've gained through running support groups for patients who are recovering from intensive care uh, with a bigger audience. Um, and we know that there are both uh, patients who are recovering and uh, relatives and healthcare professionals really that want to know more about what people can do to best support recovery for people who are coming out the other side of intensive care. So this is our first uh, webinar broadcast. Um, I'm just going to start off by telling you a little bit about the background to the charity. So who are we? Um, what are we all about? Uh, so we are ICU, Ste ICU Steps. We are the only uh, patient uh, support charity in the United Kingdom that solely represents patients. Um, and our aim uh, is that, that critical illness we know can be a traumatic experience, but we want to help uh, support people coming through the other side so that surviving critical care isn't so traumatic. And how we came about, so this is Peter Gibbs, uh, Peter Gibb, who is our chief executive of the charity. And in 2003, he had significant injuries following a nasty mountain bike accident. accident. Um, he went into Milton Keynes Hospital with um, head, neck and uh, lung injuries um, and was ventilated on intensive care for a number of weeks. And after he was discharged to the ward, he continued to have quite significant delirium. Uh, during which he managed to convince the staff at the hospital that actually he was well enough to be discharged. And while still acutely delirious, he uh, mm. discharged himself home. Afterwards, uh, meeting up with Mo, who's on the call this evening, who's one of our intensive care nurses, uh, met, him, met Peter in a follow-up clinic and they start, started together to make sense of exactly what he'd been through. And together they came up with the aim of really trying to improve the support for intensive care patients. <coughs> there are three main pillars of the support that as a charity we try to provide. The mainstay of this, which is based on the work of Mills and Keynes, is of peer-to-peer -peer support groups. And we know from our experience that um, it's, it's an isolating experience to come through intensive care. Um, with something like uh, a heart attack or breast cancer, many people will know somebody else who's been through something similar. Whereas prior to coronavirus, very few people really had any idea of what intensive care was. It certainly sounded very frightening. Um, and so coming out the other side of it, most people didn't have somebody else that they could talk to about their experience to make it feel less isolating. Um, and so the support groups came together really as a, a, an opportunity for people to sit down and talk through their experiences with someone who's been through something similar and with healthcare professionals that can help them to make sense of their experiences. Um, and from the initial group in Milton Keynes, we've now got a whole um, set of groups that meet up, usually connected to one of the local hospitals, but usually se slightly separate from it um, and provide support for patients around the country. We would like more. And for many people um, who aren't that close to a local group, um, we also have the Health Unlocked Forum, which is the ICU, ICU Steps online community. Um, and this isn't limited to people who, are follow, who have recovered from intensive care. We have many participants who have relatives or loved ones in intensive care. Um, and that has a wealth of um, peer support within that. Um, and uh, some of our um, trustees also co contribute to that. So the second pillar, we have a wealth of information which can be uh, gathered from our um, ICU Steps website. Um, and we have uh, produced leaflets which are now given out to all intensive care units across the country uh, to help people to make sense of what they've been through. Um, at the time, many people aren't really able to take on that much information. Um, and so having literature to be able to read afterwards can be extremely helpful. And there are sub uh, leaflets on delirium, on uh, uh, nutrition support, um, and what the different tests mean and, and how you can help recovery. And these leaflets have now been translated into a huge range of different languages, uh, including Welsh, um, and these are all available for free downloads uh, from the uh, website. And we also have a fantastic children's book, which has been developed by one of our trustees who was herself in intensive care, while also having two uh, young children at home. And she developed this booklet to help to explain to children who may have parents or grandparents or other loved ones uh, what intensive care is. Um, and these fantastic booklets can also be ordered through our website. And the final pillar is to link uh, uh, critical care research and people who are undertaking research with the um, patients who can provide an intensive care patient voice to help support further research. And this may be limited to helping with study design, 
but also we've given a patient voice into many of the um, national guidelines, the NICE guidelines, um, particularly during the coronavirus era, we have contributed patient voice to um, multiple documents that have come out, including those that are looking at improving rehabilitation for critical care patients. And if any of those on the call or any of the, anybody who is listening uh, to this recording afterwards wants to get involved with that, um, there is a, a, a form on our website for people who want to get involved in ITU research um, as patients and as survivors, um, or I can um, put, put people in touch. So this is our first um, ICU Stacks webinar. Uh, we are very slightly nervous. Uh, I'm running all the technology stuff here and I'm going to link you through to our um, experts for, who are, who are um, linked in from around the country. I'm going to pitch it as question and answer format. Um, and if people who are listening uh, want to put uh, questions into the chat function, into the chat box, um, then at an appropriate moment I can ask some of these questions. Um, and we can also use the questions to go into uh, to more detail in future webinars. So we're planning for this to be the first of many. Um, and we're hoping to, uh, this one's going to be kind of going to quite general things about recovering from critical illness. Um, but we are also hoping to have different experts come and join us. And we have planned uh, one that's going to be looking at uh, citizens advice and kind of legal aspects for people recovering, because we know that can be a real issue and source of concern and worry for many of our patients and relatives. Uh, so without more further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panel. So uh, Mo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Um, I'm sure that actually probably some of you may well have met me or have emailed me as a contact. Um, but um, my name is Mo Peskett. Um, I've got 33 years of experience working in critical care and I retired um, from my post as a senior sister in Milton Keynes Intensive Care Unit probably almost three years ago now. I have a bank contract and I have worked through COVID, um, but in the last couple of weeks, I'm now working for Theatres Recovery, just doing two days a week. Um, I was very fortunate to run the intensive care follow-up service at Milton Keynes for 16 years. And then in 2005, I co-founded um, IC Steps with Peter Gibb. Fantastic, thank you Mo. And Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Christina Jones. I'm a retired nurse consultant in critical care rehabilitation and also a psychotherapist. I ran the follow-up clinic at Whiston Hospital on Merseyside for 23 years and introduced uh, ICU Diaries to the UK. I also established ICU Steps Chester and Mersey before I, uh, before I retired. I'm now the research manager for ICU Steps. Fantastic. And um, don't have a picture there, but Peter Julian has very kindly agreed to uh, join us for the call. Um, Peter uh, speaks, is, is someone, I'll let, I'll let him talk, but he, he has recovered himself from uh, critical illness and coronavirus and speaks very eloquently on, on that, those topics. Peter, would you introduce yourself for us? Yeah, hello. So I'm Peter. Um, on the 2nd of April, I went into Wivenshaw Hospital uh, with COVID. Uh, I went straight onto a ventilator. Uh, and I was on a ventilator for nine days, spent a further two days in ICU, and then a further five days uh, in a recovery ward. So 16 days in total. And if my maths is right, I'm about 13 and a half weeks out now from hospital. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you everyone for joining us. And so I don't know, hopefully everyone at home can see this. I have just got a quick poll uh, to share with you. And it's helpful for us just to be able to really get a feel for what background uh, people come from. So for people listening to the call, um, hopefully you can see a poll that's come up and you can uh, see which of these questions will best apply to you in terms of what your background is. Okay, so we've got mostly healthcare work or entirely healthcare workers. There's a couple more 
maybe haven't seen it. Okay. All right, I will end it there. Okay, so possibly we have some former patients that haven't wanted to reply to the polling, which is absolutely fine. Um, it's just helpful for us to get an idea of uh, what the mix of people is and whether people are recovering themselves or not. Um, oh, one former ICU patient. Okay, thank you for that. So without further ado, one, one last thing I was just going to say is that, that so with, with the advice here, we are very much speaking from our experience. So for me, um, running the support group for many years um, and having been a consultant in intensive care for 12 years, um, really we're speaking to uh, what, what things we think and we have found in our experience that people find helpful for their recovery. So while people may have questions about um, specific medical things around the coronavirus, that's not the specific aim of what we're looking at here. We're looking really to provide tips and and support and expertise in, in, the, in the recovery process. Um, and that's something that we think we really haven't seen very much of for, from the different um, bits of literature and things that are coming out so far. And I think that's partly because a lot of this work really doesn't quite get the attention that it needs. So without further ado, I will take us on to our first question. Uh, let's go back to the screen share. So starting off with a really very general question about recovery from critical illness. And um, one of the things I've been asked many, many times in the support group is, is you know, Doc, I've, I've, I feel like I thought I would be feeling better by now. Um, you know, it's, it's so many weeks, weeks since, you know, three months since I left intensive care and I'm still feeling exhausted and I thought I'd be better now. How long does it take to recover from critical illness? Um, Mo, would you be able to kick us off with that one? Yes, um, I think I've thought about this uh, uh, and actually I don't really think there's there's any real sort of answers that, that can be absolutely sort of categoric. So I think for me, um, talking to, to patients when they come back to follow up, that, that's the question that they always ask and it's a bit like uh, how long is a, is a piece of string and I think the things that, take in, that you have to take into consideration are obviously um, at the length of stay, why you were admitted to intensive care in the first place, how many days that you may have been on a ventilator. So and I think that um, one of the things that I try to do is, is I, I try to give patients a little bit of sort of information. Um, and I'm sure everybody knows, but you know, we lose a, probably around about 3% of our muscle mass. Um, for every day that we're on a ventilator. So it doesn't take long to, to do quick mathematics if you're ventilated for seven, 10 days, that that's 30% of your muscle mass already lost. Um, whilst you're obviously losing that muscle mass, you lose protein stores um, because that's what's needed for, for recovery. So you're already losing a lot of skeletal muscle. So I think that's really key. Um, to giving patients some information because actually I think they they sort of take that on board and and have sort of some idea there's sort of a bit of a light bulb moment as to actually okay well that's probably you know they do their calculations and then have a little think about what some what that's done to them physically um I think that um one of the other things I think is that there's there's also we certainly know with COVID, but there are lots of different um, problems, physical problems that, that we're seeing that, that are going to take time to recover from. But I think um, it's also about that element of, of motivation, um, whether we feel that we are psychologically able to, to take part in any form of rehabilitation and exercise, whether that would um, obviously help the, the length of recovery. But I think, Primarily, for the, the thing that I, I think a lot about is that we, we really do need, in terms of the length of time, we need to take things quite slowly and we need to build up those um, levels of um, exercise as we go forward. And, and interestingly, I was listening to something today about, you may well have heard it, that there's something at the moment called the, the boom and bust 
sort of phenomenon, which is about, um, you know, we're home. As an intensive care patient, you are probably very grateful to be alive. And the one thing you wanted to do was to get out of hospital. And those two things have happened. So you're home, you're alive, and now you just want to get on with your life. You want to put the past behind and you, you just want to, uh, to move forward. And that's sort of the bit of the boom really is that, okay, so we're gonna just crack on. We did this before, so why can't we do that again? And then almost there's, there's, comes the bust bit because actually we push so hard that actually then um, we aren't able you know the next day or the day after we're physically exhausted so i think there's a there's some uh education um and information that's needed uh to help to help going forward um with that recovery period if any just to just to sort of to say most most people certainly in research and things that you can read we're, we're probably talking 12 to 18 months for, 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 for recovery. And that's about recovering from critical illness and, and having some sort of quality of life. It may be that, that, there's, that a full recovery isn't able to happen, but, but it's about quality of life and what is acceptable to you. But sort of rule of thumb, 12 to 18 months. Great, thanks Mo. Christina, did you want to add anything into that? Yeah, I think, I think one thing that I would say, and, and, and I've always said this to, to patients as they start to recover, is make a record of where you're at. Um, it, it doesn't have to be daily. You can, you can just write something down each week. This is what I can do at the moment. I can, I can walk for five minutes and then I'm, I'm tired and I need to sit down. So that when you come to you know, several weeks down the line, Instead of comparing yourself to your, to your normal, which is very tempting to do, um, you compare yourself to how you were when you first came out of intensive care um, so that you get a true picture of, of how much progress you've made. Mm -hmm. So kind of journaling and um, just really having a sort of an active idea of, kind of just how, how much progress you're making rather than comparing to the beforehand. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. definitely we find that that really it's about just kind of recalibrating expectations of what you can do um, particularly in the early days people are going to feel really fatigued um, and managing fatigue um, is, is really going to be a work in progress and the diary and the journaling can really help with that to work out what things um, people find too taxing and to be able to kind of not put all of the all of the difficult activities into one time frame but just to space them out to allow adequate recovery Lisa, you're just going through this at the moment. Um, uh, are you able to, to, to describe for us what that feels like for you? Yeah, so um, I think when I first came out, the challenge was I didn't have a benchmark um, to know where I should be. Um, I didn't get any advice or support from my local GP either. Um, in terms of the challenges, I sort of break them down into sort of groupings really. So physically, um, I came out, I was very lucky. Um, I was able to walk. I was the only one that I knew that was able to walk up the stairs uh, on the first sort of day I was back. Um, and I think I was fairly relaxed about how long that might take to get physically better. That said, the thing you spoke about earlier about boom and bust, because I had no measure, I didn't know if I was doing really well or really badly. Um, and I had just had these depressing episodes uh, of not knowing how far I could walk, for example. And then the next day being so fatigued, I couldn't get off the sofa for several, well, for several days after. Um, in the last, I don't know, six weeks, I've realized that gradually growing it each day is the right approach. So maybe by 10% in time, and I'm clearly getting physically better, but I recognize it's a long journey. And I think what Mo said about being 12 to 18 months is, is, is bang on the money would be my guess. Um, cognitively, it's a real struggle. Um, I've been really shocked uh, at my inability to follow conversations. Uh, I find background noise uh, a, a real problem. 
Um, it takes me a long time to do stuff uh, and I have to manage what I do in a day. Uh, and that's really, really hard um, to deal with. Uh, that's cut to my core. Um, psychologically, uh, I've, I think I've got off fairly lightly so far. Uh, I've had a couple of flashbacks. I haven't particularly had nightmares. Um, but what this has done has been broader than just me. This has been massively traumatic for, for my family, um, as well as myself, I guess. And uh, those are the areas of difficulty. And I think the common feeling that people have who've been in ICU is because we're fairly rare to our friends and family in terms of how, people you, how many people you know in your life have been in ICU, that feeling of it, of, of just being alone is, um, is quite hard. Uh, and it's hard to find people that understand what you're going through. And that includes GPs, because the stat I read in the British Medical Journal is the average GP only sees someone from ICU every two to three years. So you feel quite lonely. Yeah. Um, and Peter, what, what things in terms of just um, learning to kind of calibrate and regrade what you're doing each day, what sort of things have you found helpful? Um, it's a really good question. I mean, probably the most useful thing that I've tried to do, um, and I won't say I'm doing it 10 out of 10 times, is um, not associating um, fatigue or the inability to do anything with going straight to hating myself or, or feeling dreadful. Um, and that's quite hard. Um, I have had fatigue now for six days uh, where I've been really wiped out. Today is the first day I've not felt that way in, in six days. And it is really hard uh, not to let that get to you. And I'm in the lakes at the moment on holiday play to go hill walking and I was sort of looking at the hills all day thinking oh god I keep supposed to climb those and then desperately telling myself don't worry about it Pete the lakes are flat stay there so <laughs> so yeah just not going back to the this is what I used to do I can't do it it must be me there must be some major physical problem but logically that's quite easy emotionally and in the moment it's really difficult mm -hmm. Um, the other strategy I think is just telling people so I just tell people up front if you're coming to see me at home maybe I can see you for an hour maybe that'll be it and by the way I struggle to follow some conversations and stuff and uh, you know if I look a bit more gormless than I normally do hopefully that's the reason so uh, mm. yeah yeah just telling people um, and finally pacing what I find is if I've got a mental job to do in the day, limiting the number of jobs I do each day is really important. Only doing those that, are, that I need to do, delegating them where I can, and whether it's physical or cognitive energy that I'm expending, um, making sure that I have an hour downtime between tasks, because if I don't, I'm gonna pay the price, not just tomorrow, but for many days. And you know, most recently, that's been in the last week where I can't even see what I overdid, if I'm honest, but I've been wiped out for five days. Um, mm. So you apply these strategies and I think you hope for the best, really. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and your description is extremely powerful. Um, and and I, I kind of would add for people listening to this that um, the experience that Peter is, is describing, um, we are obviously seeing um, in great numbers with our patients who are recovering from uh, COVID. But it's a very similar experience to people who are recovering from critical illness uh, from other causes, whether that be from brain injuries or from uh, severe sepsis, from other causes or from traumas or, or whatever the cause. Um, this description of, of recovery from critical care is extremely similar across all of those different causes. Um, and, and so we put that information there that, that, that although Peter obviously speaks to the recovery from COVID, these principles about recovery would apply really to anyone um, who's been through intensive care for whatever cause. Um, and particularly powerful, this sort of sense of um, feeling like you're letting yourself down really if you kind of can't quite do what you used to be able to do um, and feeling like there's something wrong with you. And I think for many people also, that um, also can lead to worries that actually they're about to get sick again. 
Um, and many of our former patients have described that worrying that, that this exhaustion actually is a sign that there's something medically wrong with them again. Um, and that can feed into the kind of sense of um, despair and disillusionment. Um, and from our experience, running support groups I just would like to add that although these times are difficult and the recovery is much slower than people would want that it, it for most people it does persist into some sort of sustained recovery over a period of time as Mo says it may ne not necessarily get back to the former levels um, but that there is hope and that things do improve um, and particularly through the difficult early days um, I think it's helpful to give people hope that things get better. Christina, would you um, be able to talk us through some of the strategies that, sorry, Mo's put her hand up there. Do you want to come in? Can there? I just ask one question, Kate? So quite, you know, I was just chat, just chatting just now to somebody. Um, how, how do you want to go about that? Do you want, do you want us to, to talk about that now? Obviously the, the person who's just popped a question up there about um, uh, IC Steps Group, um, I've just, you know, obviously I've answered but I'm happy to um, I'm happy to to talk about it if that's something you wanted to do a little bit further down the line. I just wanted okay. to check because yeah. I'm I mean, busily I, I, typing, but I could talk about it too. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We'll we'll, we'll uh, we can run through these questions, and then certainly we can talk about support groups locally. Right. And we would we would love to have more locally, and 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 definitely we any of us, but particularly Mo, can put you in touch with how to go about that. Um, do you want to take it as a question now, seeing as it's come up? Okay, so one of the things that I would just say, this is very quickly, so for anybody that wants to contact me, obviously please use my email address and, and I can send you some information. What we decided to do um, some years ago was that um, we, were, we were having lots of, lots of contacts about setting up support groups and we were, that's how, it, you know, that, it was a very informal way of doing it. We've, we've formalized the process now. So we do have an affiliation process um, to become an ICU steps group. And I have um, sort of documents that I can send to you that just in, in very plain English, just breaks down the reasons why we chose to do that. But it's very much just about protecting you, protecting us, and all singing from the same song sheet, which the bottom line is, is that we are to, here to provide information and support to patients and relatives following critical illness. That's the bottom line. Um, no politics, no religion, just, just that's, that's what we're about. So we have an affiliation process. But the one thing that I've tried to say to, to everybody who is wanting to set up a support group. The, the, the groups that have been very successful have followed this process. And that is that just bring together your core group of patients and relatives and maybe a couple of healthcare professionals who are happy to, um, to coordinate that. Um, bring together your core group first which is exactly what we did. When we started, uh, we were, the, you know, Milton Keynes was the first support group. I thought it was only going to be the only support group. I had no idea at that time that we would be sitting here today, um, having been so successful. However, I think what we did was, I literally, um, through the follow-up service, I contacted patients and relatives who'd been through follow-up over, over an 18 month period. And I asked them some specific questions about whether, what, what support for them would look like, whether it would be a telephone service, whether it would be, well now obviously a virtual support, or whether it would be face-to-face -face meetings. And that, the bottom line was that, that was what the people around the table over time came up with. But what we didn't realize at the time was, that was our core group establishing. And that, if I've got any one bit of really vital information, is just make sure that you establish your core group first, because it will be that core group that will then go on to help you meet other people who've been through similar circumstances. But what we found was that kept that core group were starting to share their experiences without knowing it really. And then once they had gone through that, they then were prepared to share that with other people. So that's my, that's probably my number one top tip if you wanted to get a group going. So do, do that first um, and then think about an affiliation 
process, which is, which is actually sounds much worse than it is, but it, it is just about being protected and, and joining with all the other groups that have affiliated, which then in turn, hopefully gives us that much bigger voice when we have um, obviously national platforms to present at, whether we, you know, with, with, uh, with all the research that, that Christina leads on, um, you know, we, we are seen as experts and that's, that's the beauty of having groups affiliated to us. So I, I hope that helps a little bit, um, but please email me if you would like to know any further details. And the um, specific question was on about Manchester on the chat. And um, what I've done uh, with a healthcare professional is do exactly what you've just suggested, which is set up a group primarily, well, it's for Greater Manchester for the very reason that there was nothing in Greater Manchester. So we're on about our fourth meeting tomorrow at seven. Um, we have a fortnightly Zoom meeting um, and, you know, the approach will be, as you say, we'll, we'll, we'll poodle along in our early days and then look for uh, affiliation at some time in the future when certain Absolutely. cocks are less rusty than they are now, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely. Um, and and, and um, the, the, the groups that are already established, there are links to them um, on the ICU STEPS uh, website um, and uh, any of us can put you in touch with those groups if that's helpful. Um, some of the groups are also quite active on Twitter, um, which is, is a useful place also for finding out mm. when there are meetings happening. We don't have a page about the Zoom meetings yet on our website, but we're hoping to um, have that up there shortly. Um, I think as with many people, we're just finding our footsteps with um, running the support groups on Zoom. And actually it, it translates extremely well, I think we're finding. Um, the Chester group have been running for some weeks now, um, uh, really successfully. Um, and we are just about to host our second meeting in Brighton. Um, and yeah, so yeah, we can certainly signpost people towards those things, but um, either via the website or via any of us, we can put you in those directions. Um, and also if people are looking to set up groups, we can provide links for support so for established groups can partner up with people just to provide assistance or advice if that's useful for anyone. Go on, Mo. Um, just, uh, just something I thought that might be, might be just probably useful information, but I think certainly because of Greater Manchester, I think one of the things that we found right in the very early stages, um, the, the second group, well actually, yes, the second group to join us, um, uh, was the um, Royal Brompton and they had excellent facilities and really good support and the service um, was you know they had a follow-up service and then they had their support group uh, later on. I think one of the things that I found over time is that some of the the bigger the bigger uh, units uh, more tertiary centres do struggle um, to to be successful in having a support group because obviously um, certainly as what happened with with the London support group was that um, the lots of people were being were coming to the to the hospital for their for obviously for their treatment and then once they were well enough they were obviously then being transferred back to their um, DGH or, or wherever and so when the time came to be offered an opportunity to either go to follow-up or to come to a support group they probably were too far out of the catchment area. Um, I think having said that, the, the beauty of the virtual support groups is probably going to make that, obviously that a whole lot better. Um, and I really do see that this is probably going to be something that is really going to take off. But it's just a sort of a little bit of a snippet of, of um, from my experience really, it was just trying to make a time available when your patients were, were coming back to their to probably to their follow-up appointment and not to be disappointed if people aren't able to come because obviously of their transport or you know the miles that they live away and that could be you know a long way away for some people so it's just a, it's just something that we've we've learned going along going you know going along the uh, the route as i say and I think it's, it's probably important to differentiate for people the follow-up clinics which are run by some of the intensive care units 
um, and ICU step support groups, which in general we try and run slightly separate to the hospital, mostly because it can be a really quite traumatic experience for people who've come through intensive care going back to the hospital. Sometimes it can be helpful to go on a visit to the unit to see it, but we in general try to keep the support groups um, separate as a separate kind of entity, um, although there may be links between the two of them. Um, and certainly for most of us, we run it as a volunteer thing in our spare time. Um, and so it's not kind of technically connected to the hospital trust in that way. Just just quickly, that that's, that is something that's in the affiliation, is that IC steps groups are independent of any of any hospital trust. And that is purely because then they have their voice. The patients and, and, the, and the relatives have their voice and uh, healthcare, the, the local trusts aren't sort of putting their stamp on something which obviously is independent from, from the hospitals. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for all of that, Mo. Um, so we're just going to come back, Christina, if you could speak to us a bit again about um, different tips and things that you've learned over the years for um, helping to support recovery. We've talked a little bit about journaling and, and the use of the patient diaries. Um, what other tools and things have you used? I think the thing is, the, as, as Peter was saying and Mo, the boom and bust is, is really difficult and it's about pacing yourself. And so um, when I was doing my PhD, I designed a rehabilitation package and I used something called the Borg Exertion Scale which um, correlates very well with um, people's blood pressure, sorry, heart rate. And so you, what you need to do is sort of be somewhere in the middle, hard to somewhat hard, but not very hard when you exercise so that you're not exhausted. You, you can still hold a conversation. You're not so breathless that you can't, you can't speak to somebody. Um, it's also good if you exercise with somebody. So if you've got a family member who's happy to exercise with you, it, it'll give you motivation to exercise. Um, certainly ICU Steps Chester run two um, sit, sitting exercise groups um, a week, and they also do two yoga sessions a week. And uh, if you look on the ICU Steps Chester website, you'll see the details for that and how to get the login. So they're done on, um, on Zoom. And um, there are also some videos um, available on YouTube, again, through the ICU Steps Chester website and also um, through um, Brighton have also done a, an exercise video. So there's a number of different ways that you can actually find things to, to, to do to exercise. But you've got to remember your balance won't be as good as it was. So that's a good reason for starting with sit down exercises to get your, get your strength and your, your, your joint mobility um, coming back. And also when you go walking somewhere, then remember wherever you walk to, you've got to come back. So you've got to give yourself um, you don't walk to the point where you're so exhausted, you think to yourself, well, I can't get back now, uh, unless you're going to phone up for an Uber, you're really stuck. So, um, so it's about pacing and making sure that you um, have got the strength to go on. And that the next day, you're not going to feel so achy. You will feel achy. Everybody who starts exercise feels achy, but you, when you've lost that much muscle mass, you're likely to feel more achy. And um, particularly with COVID, what's been coming through is that people are having problems with um, their shoulders. And it could be coming from the whole process of being prone. And so there are exercises available, um, particularly for shoulders on the ICU Steps Jester website as well. So there's a number of things that you can be doing. And gradually, if you follow that, you will start to see that you're improving. But, like I said, <laughs> it's good if you've kept a record where you're up to. At the end of each week, you think to yourself, okay, I'll just increase it a tiny bit. And then come six weeks down the line, you can look back and you can see how much difference it's made. 
But you've also got to remember that the body and the mind are not separated. So if you're anxious or depressed, then it will affect how you exercise and how much exercise you do. Your motivation, if you're very depressed, um, will not be there. And so you have to address both the physical and the mental aspects of recovery. Fantastic, that's really helpful. Um, Peter, did you have anything else that you wanted to add into that? You've said quite a bit already. Yeah, no, I mean, just to uh, endorse uh, what Christina said, I I've joined the ICU Steps Chester team. I do their exercise classes, they're seated, they're really great, um, they've really helped me. The people there doing it with you are a great bunch of people and they've been through ICU by and large um, or been around them and that helps, that really helps your, your spirits. Uh, having something to look forward to three or four t times a week is really important. Um, and just to re-endorse uh, Christina's point, we journal, I've been keeping one. And, um, you know, I can just see my physical improvement over when I look back, but I don't always see it in the day. In the day, I can still feel crushed. And you need something there to say how far you've come. So that, that's all I have to add, really. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. And have you, tried the, have you tried the yoga class yet? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love the yoga class, yeah. Um, and it's it's weird the yoga class it's those really subtle uh exercises on your core mm. i suffer more from doing the yoga the day not suffer that's the wrong word i can feel the benefit of the yoga <laughs> than the exercise classes and they're they they're really good and we get to laugh at each other in the yoga class as well because there's um I think the common reaction from other middle-aged men like me is if, if you'd have told me five years ago I'd be doing yoga whilst other middle-aged men watched me, um, I think I, I'd have told you to get out of here. But it's, uh, it's really uplifting and, uh, and spiritually good. And that plays back to the point about depression. If you can have a laugh while you're doing something, uh, it all helps. Yeah. As as like me. <laughs> the, the laughing, laughing, doing your down-facing dog. Oh, we, we, we got worse than that. We were, a roaring lion apparently last week which I've got no idea what that is other than plain humiliating but it's all good stuff and <laughs> and it, 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 it leaves a smile on your face yeah and also it links very much in with um, Christina talking about linking the mind and the body and not Absolutely. just treating one but treating both together and the the breathing exercises and the just kind of the physical awareness in the different postures um, is really really helpful and you know, I think this if, if this brings people to yoga that maybe wouldn't have considered it normally. I think that's really, really fantastic. Great. And yeah. if anyone has any more questions that they want to put to us um, in the chat function as well, that's 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 really great. I'm just having a read through about the progressing of different exercises and any top tips about changes in taste, hair loss, and managing neuropathy. Um, that's those are really really interesting questions and certainly for for those of us who run support groups uh one of the i think top questions and distressing things that people find is a, around hair loss um and um it, it's 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 interesting how often it is because often people don't link the fact that they've been critically ill with the hair loss which often comes a bit of time later i mean certainly it can start when people are um, uh, still in hospital but often it will continue for a period of of some uh, weeks or months afterwards um, and I've just run out um, zoom support group for our local group in Brighton uh, last week and that was again the top question that came up and it's something that I think we don't as healthcare professionals realize the importance of uh, while people are in hospital so um, very little advice is provided and I think there's there's actually not much written about it in the literature I've, a couple of times I've had a good search through it um, my advice around the hair loss is that um, coming through intensive care requires um, often the, the, our vitamin de, uh, stores are very depleted by all of this um, and there's, there's no kind of evidence or randomized controlled trials that suggest replacing vitamins in this group will help with hair loss um, but just thinking about the sheer um, particularly if people have been in multi-organ failure particularly if people have 
you know, on kidney dialysis, which will automatically remove the water soluble vitamins, people can end up being really quite vitamin deficient after all of this. So my advice would be to start off obviously with a, with a, with a healthy diet, but many people find their appetite is still quite disturbed for a period of time afterwards. Um, but to start off with a, a sensible um, basic multivitamin um, to particularly replace the zinc and all of the trace elements which are important for hair growth or for the growth of any rapidly dividing um, kind of tissues like skin. Often people have skin changes which can last a period of time. Um, the other thing around hair loss is that it, it does get better. Usually the loss will peak around sort of three to four months um, and for periods of time after that slowly it will improve. Um, there are some uh, people have found some shampoos which are more helpful than others. I don't know the names of them. Christina may know. Um, it's Regain. Regain? Yeah. And do we know, yeah. has, anyone, has anyone actually found that beneficial? Um, they, they're just anecdotal reports. Yeah. I mean, but I, the, other thing, the other thing you've got to remember is the sensible things like not heating the hair, so letting the hair dry naturally, not using... Uh, roller, you know, heated rollers or anything like that, because that will damage the hair further. Yeah. So having a good haircut, if you can get an appointment, get a really good haircut, because that will at least give shape to what hair is there. Um, and also um, you, can, um, you can do things like... Uh, wash and, and when you're washing your hair actually massaging the scalp is supposed to actually promote um hair growth uh, and mm. if nothing else it's actually quite relaxing to mm. uh, to have your you know to massage your scalp yeah um but but there's certainly there's there's no kind of great evidence for, for specific things that help in that those situations um but particularly regarding the vitamins and, and i would say that goes for the neuropathy as well um, top tips around taste change. Again, that could be something that's really difficult. Um, and, and so obviously with the coronavirus, um, many people are finding that their taste is, is impaired from the virus. And for most people that will recover, but not for everybody. But also around critical illness as well prior to this, and for people who've had chemotherapy and all manner of different things um, uh, that can affect our, our, our taste perception, sensation and perception. Um, and I think that can be a real, real challenge for people. Um, finding foods that are either more flavoursome uh, or possibly more spicy or have more intense flavours can be helpful. But some people will have a real aversion to those. And I think it's hugely personal um, as to how to manage it. And um, these are all kind of quite, uh, on the one hand, kind of surviving intensive care. You kind of, there's the kind of gratitude for coming through it. But these soft and subtle things can really have very significant effects on people's quality of life. Um, and we hear it described time and time again that the kind of sheer number of small things that mean their life is not quite as it was before or their sense of themselves is not quite as it was before can add up into um, towards kind of uh, low mood and depression and anxiety and all of these things. Um, so the main thing I guess I would say apart from um, adding some vitamins would be just to have awareness of these things that they 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 are real they are, they are affecting and they do in general get better over time um, mm. but that progress can be really quite slow um, and again kind of just diarising that or journaling it and just documenting what, what what things you notice at different times just can help to see the very slow progress through that go on mate. i think um i just think really just the, the key to all to everything that we've just talked about is about having information and if we don't do anything else we just need to provide information to patients and relatives before they leave hospital because i think that's something that obviously certainly with covid hasn't happened because of just for the whole reason um, not having any relatives etc and and patients obviously being discharged from itu very quickly um, to make space but i just think to, to everybody i think making sure that you have um information available is absolutely key from from the contacts that we get from the patients and family members that we talk to more often than not, there'll be two things that they talk about. There'll be that they found the intensive care booklet, the guide to intensive care, absolutely invaluable. Uh, it became their Bible. And secondly, um, having the opportunity to talk to others 
via Health Unlocked at the very early stages. I think they are really two very um, key important uh, pieces of information. Okay, brilliant. And someone's just posting there how helpful the ICU steps booklet have been for people coming to the follow up unit. And we, we are endeavouring um, in this, uh, the coronavirus era because we've noticed because the units themselves have been so under such pressure that they ha have, and obviously the admin staff have not been coming into the ITUs. So the orders for our booklets have, have dropped right off. So we are um, electively um, via charitable donations, are send we're sending out the booklets to all of the units um, uh, as we're able to, just so that they've got a stock of them because we realize that actually people will be running out of resources because they've not been able to order them in. But if anyone does need any, then please do get in touch. I'm, I'm sure you will be there. getting them. Good. I am on about 170 units now. That they're, they're not out because they're still at the at the publishers, and they but they will be coming. But I'm probably at 177 units now, all getting a free box. So just bear with us. Fantastic! That's amazing, Mo. That's really great. So for our last question, and or, or last question that I kind of pre-prepared. Um, is that we know that many of our patients coming through intensive care and surviving will um, suffer from delirium. Probably more than 50%, 60% of patients in intensive care, this will be an issue at some point or another. Um, but for some, it can go on causing quite significant flashbacks. Um, and that can be really very um, anxiety inducing and debilitating. Um, Peter, would you be able to just talk us through what, how, that's, that, how that's been for you? Um. Yeah, so the delirium, um, I think it was probably um, one of the most traumatic uh, experiences for me uh, in hospital. Um, and we had a, so from my memory, and of course that's flawed and, you know, I don't know quite know what happened when, but in my memory, it didn't happen until I was in what I thought was the recovery ward coming out. Um, and I had very pleasant um, uh, delirium. Um, I was pretty sure there was a full firework display, panoramically displayed across Wivenshaw car park every night for me. Um, the bloke in the bed of opposite me had Christmas tree lights all over him every night, which was quite nice. Um, but I actually had uh, terrible hallucinations where I thought uh, people were coming to kill me um, and that resulted um, well it's just terrific um, and it resulted uh, in me trying to attack any uh, male other than the patients in my ward um, whilst uh, being on a catheter not really being able to walk more than three steps um, and when I came to half two uh, at least it was about I don't know it was breakfast time whatever time that is in in hospitals and I was just devastated because uh, I was thinking of the uh, terrible things I'd said I was thinking of the hassle I'd caused uh, my wife was rigging me for a morning check-in to see how my night was which um, wasn't one that I was proud of um, and it was awful and I had a second night of similar hallucinations. Um, luckily, um, I managed to get rid of them before I left. Uh, I left hospital, but the the hallucinations were just awful. And I felt at the time, um, because it was all hands to the pump with COVID, I felt there were a number of staff there, and there were students and whatever that didn't understand or recognise what they were seeing, which wouldn't have been the case in normal, you know, post-ICU recovery, I suspect. Um, yeah, and it was just a truly awful, um, an awful episode. Um, and uh, the other thing I've experienced uh, are flashbacks where you, you think you're back there in the moment. And I had one, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, yeah, just couldn't get out of my head. Shortness of breath, anxiety. And that isn't something I've ever had in my whole life. Um, so yeah, they're 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 really tough to deal with. And I'd put it up there. You know, there are various horrible episodes of having COVID, but I'd put it up there 
amongst the worst, really, because it was really emotionally traumatising. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that description. I think it's really helpful for people to hear and particularly to kind of hear your experience of, of the difficulty of not really being understood. Um, and I think that's very true that um, even within our intensive care units, you know, particularly, as you say, with the coronavirus, we've had staff who may be unfamiliar with um, what it is and what it's like to go through intensive care. Um, and many of our um, less experienced uh, staff may really not understand you know what that's like at all and so your your kind of description of it i think is really powerful for people um, yeah and that was obvious i mean one nurse told me just to go to sleep mm -hmm. uh, and i think you know when a junior doctor asks you what what you think they should do about it mm -hmm. when all you, whilst you're seeing a samurai behind his back coming to kill you that's um quite a uh, <laughs> you know it's, it wasn't helpful language to me at that time, you know. Yeah. Great. Christina, can you talk us through some of the things that you found that can help with the, with the delirium and, with the, and particularly with the flashbacks as well? Um, I think the, the thing about flashbacks, the, the kind of memories that, that are formed um, during these traumatic events uh, are called flashbulb memories. And they're, they're, not, they're not like normal memories. They're not stored like normal memories. The normal memories, you can fix them in time. But with flashbulb memories, when they happen again as a flashback, then it feels like everything is happening again. You're in that moment. Um, and really what we've got to recognise is for ICU patients, that period of delirium and the memories they have from that are their lived experience of intensive care. And it's not something that we should take lightly. Um, so those kind of flashbacks can be triggered by simply, you know, watching um, a program on television, maybe a, a news program about COVID. It could be an ambulance going past with the siren going. It can be it can be anything, quite small things. It could be something that that was contained in the memory. Um, that you just get reminded of and then it sets you on this path of having the flashback. Now there are psychological ways of actually helping you to control um, your reaction to the flashback and um, certainly one of the ones is something called the safe place and there's a there's a video about that that I've done on on YouTube um, have you got the link for that, Kate? Yeah, I've, I've put, I'll put it up in just one second. I'm just okay. typing a quick reply to Alison. So, so the idea of the safe place um, is that you actually look for somewhere in the past where you have felt really safe and comfortable. And it could be anything. It could be a holiday uh, where you sat on the beach or a walk through a, a forest somewhere. And it could be from your childhood, a memory from childhood. And then you proceed to practice going to that safe place. When you're feeling normal and, and not too distressed, you practice going to that safe place so that when you are distressed, you, you find it easier to get to that safe place and get yourself grounded um, and, and calm down. So that's the idea behind it. Um, I, think, I know that some people have actually used their diary to help them come to terms with flashbacks. So I had a lady who's staying in intensive care. She was convinced at some point in intensive care, um, there had been a fire and the fireman had come and rescued her out of the intensive care unit, taking her out on the bed. She could, she could feel the heat of the flames, she could smell the smoke. And then when we went through her diary, there was a point at which she was told she, she, she was actually on a tracheostomy and, and supposedly awake and had had explained to her that she was going to theatre and that she would be taken out by, um, by the porters and with all of the doctors and, and nurses and she would go to theatre to have an operation. And in her mind, her memory of being taken out by the fire brigade was that point at which she had to go to theatre. So each time she had a flashback, she reread that section of the diary to, to really ground herself 
in what had really happened rather than the memories that she had. So there's a number of different ways that, that people can ground themselves. Um, if, if there's a, a relative available when a flashback is happening, then it's about grounding the person in reality, saying, this is not really happening. Just take nice, slow, deep breaths. If they're practicing the, t the safe place, that relative can, can remind them and say, remember your safe place. And, and it may be that you've shared what that safe place is with the family. And so they're able to, to really sort of reinforce it. So there, there are a number of ways to, to bring them under control. I think one thing I would say though, if they are coming very frequently and the safe place isn't really coping, that's when you need to go for help. But the waiting list for psychological therapy through your GP are quite long. And um, the, the, the therapy I used to practice, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR, um, is very specialized and um, nowhere near as widely available as CBT, for example. Um, but for me, for these kind of memories, EMDR is by far the best therapy. And when it works, it works very quickly. So it may very well be that you may be better actually looking for a private therapist. But if it's EMDR, you'll probably only have to pay for two or three sessions, as opposed to CBT, where you'll be going for several sessions. Okay. And, and it can be really distressing, I think, also for families who are maybe witnessing um, either the flashbacks or the delirium. Um, so from my experience running the support groups, that, that seeing, seeing their loved ones in that kind of state and just being very distressed can, can, can provoke a lot of distress that also can lead to traumatic memories of the whole experience and can be really difficult. Yes. Um, Certainly my experience is that people, again, I know we keep coming back to this, but people find the journaling of the um, hallucinations extremely helpful, um, just to be able to kind of almost get out from this thing from within themselves to describe it, to kind of make it real. Um, something that seems very frightening inside, people find helpful. Um, and that may be just with conversations. And um, another of our trustees who himself was in intensive care describes when he first came out of hospital and was getting better, he felt a real kind of pressure to keep describing it to different people. Um, and you know, he, he just felt he needed to unburden himself almost of the kind of uh, descriptions of the things that he was witnessing. Um, and by talking it through a lot of times, um, he said he was very repetitive about it, but over time, although it didn't take away the kind of lived experience that you describe, um, mm -hmm. it helped to kind of lessen the sense of fear and dread that was attached to it. Um, yes. And some people will find talking it through helpful. Some people may find kind of movement or, or, or some sort of expression of it helpful. Um, and, and, and those who are um, that way inclined may find either sort of some sort of creative or artistic representation of it helpful. Um, and that, that can be, you know, you don't need to be a great artist to be able to do that, but just being able to express it from with crayons or something very basic. Um, each people, many people find different ways of doing that, but just some way of kind of making what's inside them external can be helpful. Yeah, that's what I did when I came out and I didn't know what days I'd been in there or anything like that. And with the help of my wife, I wrote up the dates I'd been in when I came out. And that was fabulous for me. It became a document which was really just retelling the, a bit about the hallucinations, but also the whole experience. Um, and it just allowed me to move on. And I haven't looked at that since then because it's out of my system now. And uh, I found that really helpful. Mm -hmm. And did you do it with a sort of typed out document or just yeah. write on a page? What I wanted to do was I hadn't really known what happened to me in terms of days. So I wrote that up with the help of my wife in terms of what she knew. Um, and then what happened was I felt I had been very cautious about not getting COVID. And I felt I was, certainly wasn't on the list to go into hospital because the advice I saw on the WHO and places like that said people like me 
maybe you'll feel a bit poorly for two or three weeks because of you know no previous health conditions or anything like that so i had this mission to share it with friends to say look if it can happen to me it can happen to you and in the end it got picked up by a friend of a friend who was a journalist for manchester evening news who pretty well lifted that document and put it on their um, website and it gave me a bit of a purpose as well because i just didn't want anybody to go through what I'd been through if they could possibly avoid it. And I think, you know, for me, a lots of people think it doesn't apply to them, but it, it kind of does. And um, when you tell it firsthand, it, you know, it has a strength, doesn't it? So it was helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and other things that kind of help talking through the delirium um, from the support group point of view, things that we found helpful over the years, um, is yeah, allowing people to talk it through, but also just providing the reassurance that um, it's not a sign that people are going mad or losing the plot. Often when people co first come to the support group, people are very frightened that they will have this, both a period of memory loss, where there may be you know, no recollection at all of really what happened from going into hospital to coming out for many people not for everybody, but for many people. Um, so there's often a real kind of sense of loss around that bit of time that's, that's missing. Um, and then that provokes a feeling that there's something wrong with their mind that although they've physically recovered, that their mind has got a problem. Um, so providing reassurance that this period of memory loss isn't a sign that people are going mad. Um, it's not a sign of Alzheimer's or of, or of other prog um, cognitive issues. Mm -hmm that it really is related to this period of intensive care delirium. Um, and that once the delirium settled down, in general, it doesn't come back. The flashbacks can, can take you back to the fear and terror of the delirium. But once the delirium settles on the whole, that continues to improve. Um, and these strategies that we've described can, um, as, as Christine says, it's very much a kind of lived real experience. So unlike a dream where you wake up and you kind of have a sense of the dream disappearing, um, I dreamt last night that my alarm clock went off at three o'clock in the morning. It took me a bit of time to realise it wasn't real. But you have that sort of sense that it was only kind of in a dream. Whereas with the delirium, it's, it's very much experienced as though it's happened to the, to the, to the person that's gone through it. It's a real event. It's, it's a lived real event. It just is one that, that didn't occur. Um, and it may well be grounded in other things that did occur, which can then add to the sense of confusion and sense of kind of just being unable to trust what's real and what's not real. And again, that sort of confusion can be really difficult for people to come to terms with and to, to manage. So reassurance that, that, that all of those are not a sense of, 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 of madness or of ongoing confusion, but it relates to the critical illness. Because I think not always do people put all of those things together and realize that they come together in this unfortunate package. Because um, it may be that you've got you, you've had pneumonia, but you, so you don't necessarily connect that with the issues with the with the brain. Um, I think that sense of reassurance, then people kind of can start to make sense of it and put it together. I think also, I mean, I joined the um, ICU Steps Chester group, and just talking to other people who've had delirium, and we we almost have a delirium story swap. And uh, you know, it's great because you're talking to people that you know totally get it and you can't have that conversation with anyone else and I, I just think just doing that and talking to people who have been through the same thing it, it takes away from it because even though I've not had delirium since I've been out I still feel traumatised by that episode um, and you know the other thing that I've been experiencing is you know memory problems both short term and long term and it's just so good to be able to talk to other people that you know get it yeah absolutely um if anyone else has any questions they want to put into the chat bit um we're kind of moving towards uh closing out the group i know peter you had a few bits of advice your kind of top tips that you had for uh healthcare um workers who either might be on the call on the call or, or maybe listening to this video afterwards um i think it's it, you know it's it, really important for people to hear kind of the patients your voice just kind of providing advice and feedback and I know that people are very grateful for the treatment they've had but give us your top tips. Um, well I think um, I think the first uh, thing is that don't set expectations that the GP is going to take 
look after you when you leave hospital because it's extremely patchy out there and it will range from some support maybe to no support which was in my case so having that raised expectation to find that there was nothing out there from from the GP there was from the hospital after about week nine week ten um, made my recovery harder um, I'd been better off not really expecting much because um, then I could have worked it out slightly differently um, I think if you are having problems with planning and organizing and remembering please don't send us links and websites which we won't be able to negotiate or remember even if we do manage to negotiate them good old-fashioned hard copy which sits on your desk that reminds you about fatigue about breathlessness about PTSD or whatever um, good old-fashioned hard copy that we can't lose so easily forget where we've put it would be really good um, and I think in all professions we get into jargon that we don't realize is jargon anymore and you know asymptomatic is a really good example to me I mean you either have symptoms or you don't and I think words like that which aren't particularly mm -hmm. jargony but is a good example are best avoided and I just think really good clear pragmatic steps on what people ought to be doing that they can understand because if you're dealing with people that are struggling to follow a conversation, just give them really clear examples. You know, grow your exercise by 10% in time every day if you feel up to it would be a really clear example. Mm -hmm. Write notes in your diary. Um, so I think those are, those are the requests I'd be making and things that had, that had they happened to me would have made it easier for me personally. Mm -hmm. And there was one more I remember that you mentioned before when we when we talked about this, which I um, is my personal bugbear. Families, was that it? No, don't no, lose all your possessions. Possession. So poor Peter, when they, when 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 Peter was brought round from the sedation, his glasses had gone missing. And my phone. And your phone, and so your yeah. wife had to bring in a pair of glasses that were seven years old, which you couldn't see through. Yeah, no, it was awful because I'm blind as a bat. And um, I personally believe that not being able to recognize a curtain for a curtain, because all I saw was a blue blur, made my hallucination worse. I'm absolutely sure when people are trying to get me to walk, if you can't see the floor or the corner, it's gonna be a bit more dangerous for you. So losing my glasses was a real problem. They never came back. Of the three people in my room that were able to talk, all of our phones went. And that meant on my wife's birthday, I couldn't ring her. Why couldn't I ring her? Well, how do I know what the numbers are? They're all in my phone. Um, and that was a problem I had before I got COVID, let alone afterwards. <laughs> no. So, you know, so sensory deprivation is not good for recovery. And um, I don't know what can be done. It's a problem that's been forever in hospitals, but not losing people's important stuff, be they hearing aids, glasses, whatever, uh, would be much appreciated. Yeah, I think it's an important reminder because I think it's easy for us to focus on all of the, the life-saving stuff and the machines, but these other bits can just be really crucial for when people will come out the other side and they're starting to recover. Um, do we have any last questions? I think there's another question in the Q&A. Let me just have a look. Oh, it's under there. Ah, oh, okay. There's a really great question, which I'm actually going to put into we're going to have another so someone has asked about whether or not there's any tips on encouraging staff to document in the patient diaries um, we are hoping well we're going to have a whole uh, webinar devoted to patient diaries because we obviously have Christina Jones who's the UK uh, lead and lead instigator of patient diaries um, and a wealth a wealth of knowledge and in Brighton we, we've managed to keep ours mostly going through the coronavirus uh, era um, and uh, really kind of forums like this and the ICU steps has been the one thing that has really helped to improve our uptake of patient diaries because we feed back the information to our ICU staff when patients come to the support group um, and you know because for many of our nursing staff when the patient leaves the ITU that will be the last 
um, that they may see of the patient. They may see them, they may come back for a follow-up visit, but for many patients, once they've left the ITU, they don't really want to come back. Um, and so for us, using the STEPS group, the ITU STEPS group, to provide uh, really the kind of ongoing story of what happens to people afterwards and how helpful people have found the diaries has been a real game changer for us in terms of um, improving staff writing and diaries. And we now have really, really fantastic uptake of that in Brighton. Um, but I, we will um, certainly, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in that, particularly because we have Christina. Um, and uh, so we're going to do a whole webinar on diaries if people would like that. Um, if everyone's happy, then I'm going to send a uh, survey questionnaire just for people to give us some feedback on what's been useful from this call this evening for everybody and what sort of things would be useful to, uh, to host calls about in the future. We're hoping to do this uh, regularly and we're looking to have sessions involving nutrition and have some other experts join us and other patients join us in the future. But nutrition, um, more about delirium, more about patient diaries. Uh, more about physio exercises and recovery and other things that people can do to help to support recovery um, and technology willing i will be po um, posting this on our youtube and we will be advertising it via twitter tomorrow for if people want to uh, signpost colleagues or friends or other patients who are recovering or really just publicize it as far and wide as you possibly can because we're really really keen to get uh, this voice out there because we know from our Health Unlocked Forum that there are a lot of people out there who are recovering from COVID and for other causes of critical illness who are really struggling at home and who this information that we have would be really, really vital for helping support their recovery. Um, so does anybody have anything finally that they'd like to add? Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to add something about the cognitive side. Um, and obviously, if you're suffering cognitive problems after intensive care, that is really, really worrying. But be reassured that usually over six to 12 months, it actually recovers and you get back to your normal. But um, getting stressed about it can actually make your cognition worse. Um, and so just keeping in mind that this is something that can happen after intensive care and maybe keeping um, a diary so that you write down appointments and everything. Um, I, I would be lost without my phone. If I lost my phone, my life would come to an end because I've never had a memory for being mm -hmm. able to remember appointments. So uh, before the days of phones, I, I religiously had a, a small diary I carried with me. Um, but now I put, put all my appointments on my phone and I always put a, an alert as well so that you get a warning before something. And, and those are just very simple things that just to make your life easier, just for the moment, until things start to, to sort themselves out. Um, and the same for things like concentration. Um, if you're struggling with background noise um, and it makes conversations very difficult, it may very well be that going to somewhere like a noisy pub is not the best place to be. And it may be, you know, just small, intimate meetings where you can actually hear everybody and what they're saying. That you'll be able to interact better than if you're overwhelmed by all this background noise. Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Just, just one, just one last thing, really, was just to say, um, just very, very quickly. We already know um, that psychological support was very vague and and uh, and not readily available. I think obviously that's going to be a whole lot worse right now. Nationally, there is an awful lot of work being done about um, trying to, well, maybe improve, not so much improve psychological support, but maybe use psychological support. It's always been, it's always been within the mental health um, budget. And I think there's, there's a lot of work being done nationally about how we tag how we can tag some of that into the into the uh, critical care rehabilitation pathway. So there is a lot of work being done nationally, but sadly, there it doesn't have doesn't obviously come to fruition right at this moment in time. So I think 
just if I had one piece of uh, one nugget was just to use as much um, of the information from the ICU steps website that you can it's readily available there's supplements um, on delirium physio lots of other things just just search it print them off um, give them out try and give people an opportunity to talk to each other and if you can do that then then I think we're probably doing an awful lot more right now than than you know than, than some others but a lot of guidelines and processes are being worked on and when they are ready they will be amazing but right now we all need to be sort of working together on what we can provide right now so um i just want to say thank you for for being with us tonight and um and hopefully you'll join us again fantastic so thank you to all of our panelists um uh thank you to uh one of our uh, attendees who has said this is the best webinar so far. So I'm very, very happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, and we, 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 know we, we know we have a wealth of knowledge and we, when we speak really kind of from the experience of, of, of the patient voice and wanting to advocate for that um, in, in intensive care, whether that's in recovery, in rehabilitation or in research, um, because we know the frustrations of that voice not being heard before. Um, and so for all of us, it's really important that we continue that. And so this is a new platform for us and uh, hopefully this will be the first of many. Um, thank you very much to everyone this evening. I'm going to close this down now. Stay cool, indeed. It's a very hot evening. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>